Today we're going to be taking a look at the book The Butterfly Blueprint by Stephanie Miller. Uh, we're going to take segments from, from her book here and uh, we're going to kind of break it down into different little parts for us to, to take as a, as a short study here. Uh, and she does it in the life cycles uh, of a butterfly. So the first one we're going to look at today is, is the egg. And uh, Stephanie will be interviewed uh, later on this week and we'll talk about this book further with her. Uh, and uh, she has given me permission to take segments from her book to do a, a bit of a study out of. We begin our journey into the butterfly perspective by first looking at the butterfly egg. Adult butterflies lay eggs very systematically and intentionally on various leaves. In fact, that is the main job is, of an adult butterfly, is to lay eggs before dying since the lifespan of adult butterflies is rather short. The color, shape, and texture of the eggs are all different depending on the species of butterfly. And just like human eggs, each butterfly is unique and different. There are no two butterfly eggs that have the same DNA. Some types of eggs are more transparent than others, so if you look closely, you can actually see the caterpillars start to, to develop. Just like this developing creature, we have been created by God for a purpose. As we begin looking at our spiritual growth through the life cycle of the butterfly, we must start with the potential of the caterpillar inside the egg. Each stage in the butterfly's life cycle has a purpose and a goal. The egg stage is representative of our potential and purpose in Christ. The goal in this stage is to successfully avoid getting eaten or destroyed and then hatch from the egg. The goal for us in this stage is to be open to a new way of thinking about ourselves, our spiritual growth, and our relationship with Jesus. Just as the butterfly eggs sit on the leaf waiting to hatch, we too sit and wait for the change to begin. When we are saved, we receive salvation. Salvation is the forgiveness of our sins that we receive by accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, John 3, 16 and 17. We also experience a transformation as the Holy Spirit deposits himself in us and, present, and the process of sanctification begins. Ephesians 1, 13 to 14, uh, and that says, And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth for the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to praise to the praise of his glory. Sanctification is the process of becoming holy. This process is something that takes time and does not happen automatically. Instead, it requires action and comfort on our or an effort on our part. Has a butterfly always been a butterfly or did it transform into a butterfly from something else? Before it was a caterpillar, what was it? We know the answer. Because it was a caterpillar, it was an egg. The egg contains the cells that were needed for growth into a caterpillar first and then transformation into a butterfly. Our lives are much the same. We start as a collection of cells in our mother's womb and those cells form our limbs, brains and other vital organs needed to sustain life. After we have grown and developed inside the womb, we mature enough to enter this world. Once the cells of the egg have properly formed the caterpillar, it is ready to hatch and begin the second stage of life. Yet you brought me out of the womb, you made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. From my mother's womb, you have been my God, Psalm 22, 9-10. From our births, we are innately, innately human. And it isn't until we accept Jesus Christ into our heart as our Lord and Savior that our birth, that our rebirth begins. What if we parallel a caterpillar butterfly with someone who is, as scripture says, of those who don't know God and are dead in their sins, Ephesians 2, 1 to 5. Uh, and we will read that in just a bit here. Uh, and someone who is transformed into a new creation in Christ. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. 
all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. Um, and then we can look at 2 Corinthians 5.17 as well, where it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. The interesting thing about a caterpillar is that since it can only crawl on the ground, it has a very limited viewpoint of the world around it. It only sees what is in front of it. On the other hand, the butterfly barely resembles the caterpillar when it emerges from the cocoon. Its viewpoint is no longer confined to the ground. Instead, it can fly with its wings and see the world in a whole new way. But what would happen if the butterfly didn't act like a butterfly? What would happen if it never tried to fly and instead tried to scoot around on the ground just like it did when it was a caterpillar? What is the difference between believing, knowing, growing, and using its wings? Which is a very important question for all, uh, us as Christians to look at, as we should always be desiring to grow and, and continue our relationship with, with Jesus Christ. It should never remain stagnant. The answer is Jesus. The change that happens in response to the Holy Spirit being deposited in your body, yes, the initial change occurred, but what if it stopped th there? What if the butterfly, even though equipped with wings, never tried to fly? As a result of doubt and fear, the butterfly might drag itself on the ground like it is still a caterpillar. This is what we are like until we accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. It is what so many of us can fall victim to if we're not careful. It's wasted potential. There is so much God wants to do for us, but he won't force himself into our lives. No, because we have choice. He gives us freedom of choice, which is very, very important in our, in our belief, is, is that freedom of choice. It's only when we make that decision for ourselves that true and lasting transformation and growth begin. We reach what I call our hatching point. When, you're given, when you are given new life through the grace of God and he transforms you into a new creation, you cannot just sit on it and do nothing. We can't afford to become stagnant or complacent in our faith. You only have to feel that way a short time to be convinced that you are a caterpillar and that it's all you'll be forever. If you aren't constantly working on your faith and relationship with God, then you will limit your own choices by your own thinking. We aren't transformed into new creations to simply just be. There is a reason, there's a cause, and there's a purpose. God is a God of reconciliation and redemption. There is nothing from your past that he does not forgive or redeem in some way. An example of this comes from the book of Acts. Um, we can see it in Acts 9, 3 to 19, when Paul, formerly known as Saul, has an encounter with Jesus who changes his life forever. When Jesus asks Saul why he's persecuting him, Saul responds, Who are you, Lord? Acts 9, 5. There is an openness and receptive spirit about this answer because Jesus could have ignored the question or said something far worse. Much like us, Saul didn't know he was searching until he found what he had been missing. If we look at the story of the Apostle Paul, when we see that a willingness and heart uh, readiness is all he really needed to be transformed, the hatching point of our new Christian life is just the acceptance of what it means to be not only a follower but also a lover of Jesus. It can, sudden, it can come suddenly when you least expect it or it can be a stirring inside you that has been going on for some time. However you experience it, it's just like an egg hatching. It literally breaks you. Our old life doesn't just go away, so that means our friends and lifestyles don't just change by themselves. We need to practice at it, and it takes time, and our old way of living can become less appealing, making decisions that encourage a stronger relationship with God and, uh, become easier. Part of what is to blame is how we listen to and respond to our hearts. Society tells us to listen to our hearts and go with what they tell us, but scripture paints a different picture. 
the truth about the heart is something contradicting. While God gives you the desires of your heart, Psalm 37, 4, Scripture tells us that the heart is a deceit is deceitful above all things, Jeremiah 17.9. So do our heart's desires always get answered, or are we to ignore what our hearts tell us because they cannot be trusted? Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart, Psalm 37.4. The heart is, a, is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Jeremiah 17.9. That's the full context of those two verses. Understanding the condition of our heart is the first step in determining heart readiness. The desires of your heart reflect those that are both in, of this world and of God. Just because you have a deep desire in your heart does not mean it will come true, but it does serve a purpose. The goal is to discern what your own personal desires are from what God is placing in your heart to have you fulfill. What happens when the desires placed in us by the world lead us astray and what happens when we are in tune with our desires directed by god one way to determine what is worldly what is a worldly desire of the heart might be instead of a godly desire um, is to pray uh, david in psalm 139 provides a moving prayer that not only asks god to reveal the sin in his heart but to also show him the better way and humility in it, humility is always important when discussing change and transformation search me god and know my heart testing me and know my anxious thoughts see if there is any offense uh, offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting psalm 139 23 to 24. god cleverly designed us to need him so the best thing to do is sit down and have an honest and open conversation with God about the condition of your heart. If you don't know what the condition of your heart is, a great first step is to ask God to reveal it to you, and he will. This isn't a one and done thing. Rather, it takes us consistently checking in with our heart's motives and having an honest dialogue with God to reach this. We have to be willing to ask ourselves hard questions and be okay with God um, when he reveals the answers. One th important thing to remember is that once we receive salvation, being right with God, we start the process of sanctification, being set apart or made, ho made holy. But the process of purifying our hearts is to live more like Jesus. And it only goes as far as we're willing to go or let it go. That means that you and I have a crucial role in our own spiritual growth. We must constantly work on our caterpillar mindset, our worldly thoughts, selfish motives, and sinful desires. A caterpillar settles into a routine and gets used to thinking and doing things its own way. Convinced that while its life isn't anything special, it isn't terrible either, but Christ didn't come to give us an okay, fine, or even good life. Christ came to give us an abundant and full life, and out of that abundance come the things you never imagined before. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full, John 10.10. 10. The first part of that verse says that the enemy comes to steal and kill and destroy. He wants to take you out of the game before you are even in it which is often reflected by trying to lure you back into your old ways. That is important to remember when determining what steps we need to take to become more like Christ. The choice to turn away from sin entirely and toward God may be easier for some of us than for others. So how do we maintain that momentum or the passion of the initial wonder and excitement? Um, when that seems to have worn off, the two important ingredients are needed to that, that are needed to maintain our faith and commitment and be active, an active follower of Christ. Um, there's two of these that she's going to bring up here. And the first is to be a living example for others by not conforming to the wonders of the world, but instead having a renewed mind 
and the second is to be in this world and not of this world. Once we accept salvation, we are in the process of being sanctified or set apart, but it is up to us to seek God and ask Him what we are being set apart for, to be able to understand and live out the calling that we are to be in this world and not of the world, as stated in John 17, 15 to 18, and that we need to be of a renewed mind, which is in Romans 2, or 12, 2. Romans, or John 17, 15 to 18 says, My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. Jesus was no stranger to being around people, places, or things of this world. He spoke openly to certain women that everyone else looked down upon or and even had dinner with a tax collector. He put himself around all sorts of people that and led by example. He didn't shy away from the hard places or the hard people, but actually proceeded to do quite the opposite. When the teachers of the law, who were the Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus told them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. Mark 2, 16-17. If Jesus never went to these types of places or engaged with these types of people, there is no telling where you or I would be now. The world as we know it would be very different. We can be thankful that Jesus meets us right where we are. Even when that is a lonely worldly place, there is no place on earth we won't, he won't go to find us. And we can be confident that in him we are no longer slaves to our worldly ways but we are free. But thanks be to God, though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. Romans 6, 17-18 From this freedom we experience in Christ uh, uh, From this experience we Sorry, from this freedom we experience in Christ comes our response by renewing our minds. Some of us may have been told that we are certain things and we're expected to do that uh, to renew our minds. We have to read the Bible. We have to go to church. We have to pray. We have to try to be good people. Saying you have to do something is like saying you need to do something. But in, And that implies discontentment and that you measure your worth or value conditionally based on whether you did what you said you needed to do. A renewed mind focuses on understanding your reasoning for doing things and making sure you are not just following the crowd. A renewed mind must desire to be transformed by having an obedient heart out of love, not fear for the, for the Father. When you remember that there is nothing you can do to separate yourself from God, no way that he will ever stop pursuing you, it gets a little easier to be motivated to change out of love and not fear. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 8, 38 and 39. Even though we always have God's love to fall back on, many of us still choose to stay right where we are and never leave our comfort zones. When it comes to our spiritual growth and pursuit of Jesus, we can be too comfortable and settle into a rut of complacent faith and stagnant growth. There is a unique thing that happens as caterpillars grow. Their skins don't grow with them. Instead of growing into their bodies, they shed their exoskeletons and take on new skin and a new body. If we think in terms of a caterpillar, when our jeans become too tight and our shirt's too small, it's time to size up and step out. Life is constant change. So if we neglect to embrace this, we will inevitably stay 
stuck.